and so you're going to get uh, you're going to get more more virulent strains that are going to cause more severe illness, and uh, that's that's the big concern. Is that right, Gert? That we must end up. We don't have to end up with more virulent strains, do we? Is that just a possibility rather than a fact? Well, yeah. Of course, I cannot say that it, it is a fact. But I'm, I'm when I follow uh, following the, the the logics and the dynamics of this uh, pandemic, and having taken a deep dive in, you know, the uh, the molecular events that are going on, and especially also trying, because that is very important, trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together, because you come always up with a hypothesis. And then the first thing you need to do is to ask yourself, is that hypothesis plausible? Is it acceptable from a virological viewpoint? from an immunological viewpoint, from a vaccine viewpoint, from an evolutionary viewpoint, etc. And when this all matches, and then you start making predictions, and what you have been hypothesizing is to some extent indeed confirmed by the data then, of course, I mean, I'm no longer talking about uh, a, a pure hypothesis. I'm talking about really a very plausible uh, prediction. And, you know, f doing this kind of exercise, for me, it is really clear that we will or that the virus will evolve to a version that is going to be more virulent. But at least what everyone Philip, and, and, you know, back to the point that uh, Shangira was making, what everybody should realize is that there is something very, very weird going on, an immunological event that we have seen with no vaccine, never seen with any kind of vaccine. The fact that you have increasing infection rates because of course they are largely underestimated the infection rates that we have resistance to neutralizing antibodies and nevertheless we have protection against severe disease and even to some extent protection against disease so in other words what we have seen at the beginning of the pandemic that the morbidity and hospitalization rates were following the infection rates is no longer true and uh you know, it's not only this disconnect, it's also the disconnect with the season. You know, SARS-CoV-2 infections are no longer seasonal. I mean, in the midst of summer, we had plenty of cases. And there is also the disconnect with age, because also younger people have had plenty of infections and, and, and even disease. So something very, very weird is going on. And um, when I explore this in detail and, you know, taking into account also some molecular studies that have been, been done and, you know, also taking a deep dive in what exactly do the, uh, the non-neutralizing antibodies do, for example, a uh, phenomenon that has been documented in, in a few publications. Well, I'm coming to the conclusion that uh, what is currently preventing severe disease that the non-neutralizing antibodies are, are playing a very, very important role into this. And uh, typically with our vaccines, we do not induce those non-neutralizing antibodies. Those are elicited when the neutralizing capacity of the serum in the vaccine is, is dramatically diminished. And, and uh, you know, there is uh, Professor Fantini, a French professor in Marseille, who has been documenting this to some extent. Uh, there are others who have been doing in vitro studies to look at the non-neutralizing antibodies to what extent they are inhibiting, for example, trans infection. So the transfer from the virus attached to a dendritic cell to a susceptible lung epithelial cell, for example, they have also been studying to what extent it is inhibiting fusion of the cells and building of syncytia, which we know is, uh, is a correlate, of course, for pathogenicity and virulence of the virus. So it's all these elements. When you take this all together, you, you come uh, you know, to the conclusion 
that there is a kind of very abnormal, unprecedented immunological event uh, triggered by the vaccines that is now protecting against severe disease, but that is most likely very temporary because also this, you know, this, um, this, uh, inf this, this um, uh, non neutralizing antibodies, uh, they are uh, short-lived and because they are short-lived and because they are T-help independent, they exert suboptimal pressure. And, you know, we have seen that the, vi the, the, the virus has overcome humoral pressure against infectiousness, humoral pressure against neutralizing antibodies. So the virus can easily come, uh, overcome, in other words, uh, humoral pressure. So for me, there is uh, no reason that uh, the humoral pressure that currently exists on virulence uh, is not going to be overcome by the virus uh, either. So, but definitely there is a very weird immunological event that nobody can explain. And, and at the very last, our public health authorities and, and, and the experts, they are not understanding what's going on. That I'm 200% convinced of. They are not understanding it. So some people like we and others have to explore this because it's nice to say, you know what, we need to be to do more surveillance and to document uh, all these mutations, describe biological uh, effects, et cetera, et cetera. But what we need, in fact, in order to protect society is to make predictions that are really based on very good science. That is how we can prevent disasters. It's not by just documenting it and post hoc describing this in, in all kinds of, uh, of publications, etc. That's why what I'm calling the molecular stamp collection that is now providing lots of food for scientists to publish. But this doesn't bring anything to society.